You're listening to a special bonus rebroadcast episode of my recent guest appearance on the Den Talks podcast. Here's what they had to say about this episode. This week, we sit down with biohacker, podcaster, and all-around information curator, Luke Story. When not doing firsthand research on innumerable biohacks or teaching kundalini yoga and meditation, Luke interviews world-renowned guests and experts in their field on his podcast, The Lifestylist, which you're obviously listening to right now. We get into it in this episode, and you may want to get a pen and paper beside you because Luke shares so many juicy takeaways about life, spirituality, and biohacking. We discuss ego, finance, spirituality, and how they all tie together, just how much being disconnected from nature is costing us, and the ongoing process of undoing everything we've been subconsciously programmed to do. Having experienced childhood trauma and drug addiction at a very early age, Luke shares very personal stories with us about his experience getting sober and reminds us that even the tiniest bit of self-love can lead to big change. Don't miss his personal practice at the end of an episode where he shares his favorite Shakespeare quote with us. So with that, my friends, I will go ahead and leave you with this bonus rebroadcast episode. Thank you so much for joining me and I hope you enjoy it. This is a really cool episode. It's a little bit longer than usual, but I love it. We've got Luke Story on, who actually has his own very popular podcast called The Lifestylist. He is known as like the premier biohacker. He literally goes and tests all these different things to optimize his health. So from surviving being injected with poisonous Amazonian frog venom to enduring weeks of neurofeedback meditation in an isolation chamber, can you believe that? He literally scours the earth for the most cutting edge and ancient technologies of healing and personal transformation. And obviously we talk about that, but what I also love about this conversation is we really get into his personal stuff. He battled sobriety and has had such a journey from there. And he really gets into what his upbringing was like in his childhood and dealing with trauma. We talk about that a lot. And I think for anyone who's dealt with anything that's kind of a holdover from their past or their childhood and knows how much it can affect you, this is a phenomenal episode for you. We also get into, obviously, because we have them, what are the biohacks? What are the simple things we can all be doing every single day and just taking advantage of how to optimize our health? We also get into the ego a lot, which we all have. We can't avoid it. And discussing how to recognize it. And what's really cool about this episode, he gives you really specific moments to recognize that your ego is talking and not you. I love it. Sit back, relax. He's so easy to talk to, so interesting so smart, so well-read. There's a lot to take from this. I hope you enjoy it. Just um, studying with different teachers and stuff is Guru Jagat is a big arm person. Like I, I love her classes, but I'm like, I'm always going to walk out with sore arms. I And I struggle with the arms. It's been like yeah. my biggest thing. But I have to say teacher training after that first week was great for me because I finally started making a point because Guru Jagat said something at once. She's like, Sometimes it's just a choice. And I was like, oh, fuck, that's like me. I'm like making the choice not to do it. So by the end, I'm like, keep them fucking, you can keep them up. And like, by the end, I was like doing it. It was not easy. Yeah. But that is my, like, I'm really, I struggle with the arms up. Yeah. I really struggle. Some people just can like sit them up there and they can just do it forever. Not me. Maybe it has to do with how long your arms are. I feel like there's more leverage pulling mine down. (laughs) I have no excuse. I'm like a little peanut. But I I heard it's also tight shoulders and my shoulders are unbelievably tight. So if you're really tight, it's harder for you. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, that makes sense. Is there a way to turn down the volume on my um, headphones? Which one? Is that better? Uh, Test one, two, more and more. Uh, There you go. Yeah, that's better. Perfect. Thank you. Of course. You don't love hearing me screaming in your ears? Oh, no. It's my own voice. It's like <laughs> thundering. I'm, it makes me talk like this, you know, because it's so loud. Now I can give my full voice. Do you like your voice? I've never really thought about it. You know, there's some people when they're recorded or on video and they're like, oh my God, I hate my voice. I've never thought about it. I, I would say neutral to not thinking it's great. But then when I started a podcast, so many people said, oh my God, you have a great voice. I thought, oh, okay. I'll go with that. Interesting. And yeah, do you funny. listen? Are you okay listening to yourself? Yeah. The thing that bugs me when I listen to myself is not my voice, but it's filler words that I'm trying to extricate from my vocabulary. What have been your go tos? We all have them. You know. You know. That's the tough one. So let's all clap when he says, you know, today. <laughs> <laughs> so I've been pretty good at getting rid of um. 
I, uh, that's hard. Those were so glaring as I started to listen back to my podcast to just refine my delivery. Those were easier to get rid of. But you know, just like roll off the tongue and they sneak in there. And they're connectors. Yeah. 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 So sometimes there's a lot of pregnant pauses because I'm aware of those words. Hold on. We're getting notes from Nicole better. And also like... Queen of it, <laughs> which drives me crazy because... I'm 48. I'm not supposed to be saying like every I, other sentence. That's exactly how I feel about it. I'm like, I'm 42, almost 43. And why am I still saying like, like what we like if I just did it in the like sentence. It's like really a ballet hard. girl. I know it's horrible. Yeah, it's hard. I'm, I'm with you. That's, I, but I, we're the same generation. It was such a part of our lexicon Yeah, that I feel like <laughs> it's hard to get rid of. It is. Yeah, I struggle listening to myself. Yeah. Always have. I, I do it because of two reasons. One, I, I don't listen to like every podcast I do now. Uh, now I'm going to be totally hyper aware of likes. <laughs> I don't listen to everyone because I just can't keep up. But I listen to probably the first year and a half every single one. So wow. I could fine tune my delivery and learn how to not over, you know, talk over the guest or just little nuances like that that I wanted to work on. But sometimes I listen because I'm not... I'm learning while the person's talking, but sometimes it's really dense. I, I interview some deeply scientific people or really esoteric spiritual teachers, and I'm there and I'm getting it, but I'm also thinking about, you know, the AV and where I want to take the conversation and, and leading it. So I'm not just a complete blank slate student. So sometimes I go back to actually so learn. I, that's amazing. From the guest. Yeah. I've done that on a few too. I'm like, I remember like really digging that conversation and then I'll actually listen to it as a listener. And it's so nice. Cause I'm like, I'm like, Oh yeah, this is why I liked it. There's so many gems from this person that totally. now I can like actually sit with. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I just interviewed this guy, Miles Neal in New York. What a name. Yeah, a Buddhist teacher and a psychiatrist. And it was one of those conversations. It was about two hours. And during the conversation, I was just sitting there going, I can't believe I do this for a living. Like, this, <laughs> this guy is so amazing. It's one of the, just the most inspiring conversations I've ever had in my life, let alone on a podcast. Have you ever been stumped? You know, uh, sometimes every once in a while, I'll interview someone who has a shtick and they just are automated. And I feel like I can't break through to the real person. Mm -hmm. And I don't like that just because I don't think it's going to be a very good episode. You can feel the difference. Yeah. Some, sometimes people, it's, I don't know if they're guarded. It's like, they're just like, oh, cool. Yeah, it's an interview. I'm in interview mode. But my interviews to me aren't interviews. They're conversations. conversations. So every once in a while that happens, or I interviewed someone recently who's brilliant and amazing and kind, and uh, it was a little challenging because I had listened to some of his other interviews. I always like study up on my guests and listen to their other podcasts and read their books and all that. And on a few other podcasts that I listened to, he had kind of his spiel. And when I interviewed him, I was like, I'm definitely not going to talk about that because I don't want him to go into that spiel. I want to ask him some some weirder questions that did he, he normally doesn't talk about. Did he find a way to get about. to it? Yeah, he did. He, like, I find that happens a it's lot. It's annoying. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> I was like, you fucking said the same exact thing on 20 other podcasts. I want my interview to be different. different. I totally hear you. I feel like that too. And you know, I'm like, they have this spiel. Let me try and do it differently. But they will find a way to get... Because yeah. also I think about it from this way. It's their comfort zone. It's like what they know... Because for some people, I don't think this is as comfortable, even if they have the knowledge. Right. So it becomes their comfort zone. But it's funny. I'm the same way. I'm like, how can I just want to hear something fresh or what's like really happening in there? I get it. Sometimes I find, since I do so many of them in person, that that helps. Because like I interviewed um, a couple months ago, this doctor named Jack Cruz, who's very controversial. And he's an expert on EMFs and uh, the dangers of blue light and all this stuff. He's a neurosurgeon. Terrifying. And um, yeah, he's really, really smart. But sometimes his personality can be a little bit abrasive to some people because he's kind of, you know, a red pill guy. I mean, he's just going to wake you up. <laughs> and then also he's just so scientific and geeky in quantum physics realm that you're like, what are you talking about? But I got him really late at night, as it turned out. We, we did our interview at like, I don't think it was like 10 to... 10 to 1 a.m. or something Whoa. like that. Yeah, because we were both speaking at an event um, on the West Side in a hotel. And I was like, dude, let me come up to your room. We'll record. And he was like, oh God, I just flew in today. I'm so tired. All right, whatever, Luke, we'll do it. 
And then I got him up there and like his defenses were down because it was such a different venue for him. He was in a it, hotel room. Yeah, yeah. Kind of sketchy, but whatever, Luke. Yeah, yeah, it was in <laughs> his hotel room. But we went for three hours and I got all of these nuggets out of him and just asked him these really oddball questions that I don't think a lot of other people have asked him. So that was an example of breaking the mold on someone just because of the environment and the novelty of you know, the, the timing and the location. Hey, so when you talk about that, you said he's so intelligent and it can be dense. Are there any moments where you feel like things are over your head and then you don't know how to grasp it or? That happens sometimes. Yeah. I would say with him, but I also dig, if I get stuck like that, I'm not afraid to just go, no, 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 wait, back up. Say understand. what you just said again. Like, let's break this down in bite-sized pieces because I think that's really what my job is, is almost like a translator. And chances are, if you're not understanding it, other people, there are people out there that aren't understanding it either. Yeah, totally. That's why I was trying to mind myself too. It's like, if you're not getting it, someone else isn't getting it as right. well. So yeah. tell me, because now you're, you're, look, you're fully immersed in this world, like biohacking, spirituality. You and I are doing this teacher training together. So clearly it's part of your life. You've made huge life shifts. Did spirit, and I know you are sober and you went through your own journey of sobriety, what happened for you first? Did you start encountering spirituality first or was it the journey of sobriety? Like when did you start kind of your stepping stone into this world? I think my first, in, I was not raised with any religion or spirituality at all, but the first experience that I had was around 1978, 79. I would have been eight or nine years old. And my mom was not religious or deeply spiritual, but she was from Berkeley and the sixties. And she hates when I call her a hippie. She actually emailed me two days ago and she's like, I am not a hippie. Here's the difference. And she wrote me this whole <laughs> breakdown because I've said that on so many podcasts. I'm like, okay. So for the record, my mom was not a hippie. She was, I think she said she was a mod. So I'm like, okay. What's a mod mean? Like a, a mod, you know, like, um, I got to let me get her email. Out. <laughs> <laughs> but You're like, it's your me, own fault, mom. To me, she was a hippie because we shopped at the health food store. She burned incense. We listened to the Eagles. And that was pretty hippie ish for a Yeah, there was a lot of plants and macrame in the house, <laughs> right? Uh, a lot of granola being eaten. Uh, anyway, I digress, but she, she was in circles that were spiritual and things like that. And she, you know, did a little yoga and, uh, what did she did tell me something. Oh, such an interesting thing that she explained to me the other day. But anyway, I digress. Uh, my mom took me to Oakland to the ashram of uh, Muktananda. You were like when eight, I was eight. Said? Yeah, yeah, eight or nine years old, and I was eight or nine. So to me, it was just a really fun place to go. And there was a lot of other kids running around, and there was incense in the air, and you could take your shoes. Well, you had to take your shoes off, and you're barefoot. And you know, we went to Darshan with him, and of course at that age, I had no idea who he was, but the experience was very enthralling. And I was completely obsessed with this entity, as was later recalled by my mom. It's like, what was I like? What was that experience like? She's like, you were just obsessed with Muktananda. And what does that mean? Like, were you just staring at him? Yeah, yeah. I was just fascinated and couldn't wait to go up and get my blessing. And, you know, years later, having studied him a bit, he was, he was a pretty powerful guy. Major, he's known as kind of the Shakti guru, where people in the room would just get blasted with enlightenment from just being around him and that kind of thing. So I think there was a seed planted in terms of my, uh, the appeal of Eastern mysticism and the whole yogic thing. You know, when I walk into your beautiful space here, Thank you. I'm like, oh, I like how all this looks. You know, there's something, yeah. there's a familiarity to it. But uh, as you said, then I traverse down the road of self destruction uh, from about that point on, actually. And interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I got a really young start. And um, so I wasn't too interested in anything spiritual. Uh, until I really had to be. And that's when I was uh, 26 years old and, you know, had this sort of horrific crash ending to my <laughs> my former life. But up until the, the moment when I got sober, uh, I had some family members on my dad's side who were going to India for some extended periods of time. And my aunt lived over there for a couple of years in the ashram of another guru named Satya Sai Baba in a little village called Puda Party. India. It's kind of in between Bangalore and Chennai. And so my family would take these pilgrimages over there and they would come back and tell me these fantastic stories about him manifesting things out of his hand and bilocating and speaking multiple languages at once to a group of people that were international and just all these really bizarre things that some, some of these you know, higher beings can do. 
And so I was very fascinated by that. And they would bring me some books. One of the books that my cousin brought back was uh, called I Am That by Nisargadatta Maharaj. Mm -hmm. And I would stare at the back of that book and just read that. And that's about as much as I could read because it was just too dense and I was too smoked mentally to... Now, Ron, how old are you at this point? 23, 24, 25, like right before I turned 26. So I, I started, the moral of the story is I started to get a sense that there was validity to spirituality and that it could be found somewhere in the East um, more so than, you know in a Christian sense and church and things like that. But it's so interesting because you say you were raised without religion and spirituality, but yet you've already said so many experiences that most people would never have had or come close to until they sought it out, whether it be college or, a, you know <laughs> right, what I mean? Right, that's interesting. Like yeah. you've already, you're like the fact that you're eight years old running around this ashram, like, do you remember, like, if you really think about it, do you remember any moments of like, even let's talk about your mom because you say your mom was kind of a mod, um, <laughs> which like, moments of how she would react to certain things. And now you're like, hey, that actually was kind of a spiritual point of view that you might not have realized was spiritual or something that's being put on you. But like she was living from that place. I don't think I was exposed to many people as a kid that were living a spiritual way of life. What did you feel like you were exposed to? <laughs> he wanted to say like, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm thinking about, I'm, I'm, super transparent and I talk about everything, but there have been a few situations in which I've implicated other people that it's like more trouble. privacy and, and anonymity. Understood. Um, so, you know, I sometimes have to just choose my words wisely. Absolutely. I, I think that I came from a, a family that had a long lineage of trauma and dysfunction and that manifested in different ways for different members of the family. So there was a lot of that that spilled over onto me when I was a kid, even though my parents both loved me. Uh, they're both fundamentally really great Love people. usually has nothing to do with right. it. Right. And we, you know, we have great relationships now, but my parents were 27 when they had me and they were, you know, I mean. They didn't know what they were doing, right. Yeah. They totally did the best they can. And I love my parents. We're, we're, we get along great. Both of them, amazing relationships now, but they were total dumbasses. I mean, they had no <laughs> idea like how to have a relationship, how to have a kid, you know, I mean, other than the fact that they, you know, loved me, there was there was a lot left to be desired. I think in terms of my upbringing. Did you have siblings? No, two half brothers. Way later, that my dad got remarried, but there, you know, there were values instilled in me. I think that I that I still hold. I mean, especially with my mom, because I was raised primarily by her, and you know, she was very liberal and uh, born and raised in Berkeley. And like when I was a little kid, I could say any word I wanted. Like I could swear. I used to show off in front of my friends and my friends would come over and be like, what the fuck, mom? And she'd be like, yeah, what, honey? You know, like, it's just no big deal. But I couldn't say the C word, <clears throat> naturally. Not all the women are down with that one. Uh, and I couldn't say anything that was um, sexist or racist. That's so, amazing, by Yeah, the way. so there was things like that when I was a kid. My mom just taught me how to be loving and be kind and, um, you know, to just uh, respect people and things like that and gave me a really open mind. You know, because I'd come home from school and I lived in an area that was predominantly kind of lower income white people and Latino people. Where, and did I, you, where were you? Up north, you said, right? Sebastopol and then a godforsaken place called Windsor, which is like next to Santa Rosa. It's a little truck stop of a town. When we moved there, it was a little rougher there. And there are a lot of drugs there. Oh my God. I mean, yeah. I know people are from there and I've driven through there. Yeah. You see it. Like it's yeah. it's it's tough. Well, that was the thing for me. It was the the environment, you know, and... um but what I was going to say was I would go to school and you, you, when you're a little kid, you're impressionable and you pick up words. And so I would come home and like um, talk about some kid at school that was a beaner or something like that. Right. You know what I mean? And my mom was like, you're done grounded forever, you know? So, so she were, set you straight. Yeah. So ways. there were things, and, you know, and then she would explain why that was completely uncool. And so uh, there were things like that, that I learned. And, you know, my dad was really, um, you know, he had experienced a lot of pain and trauma in his life and he was a really tough customer, just really angry, very aggressive, just super gnarly, tough guy. Uh, but he also instilled little, things like- like Great Santini-ish? 
my dad was like the Marlboro man, you know, mm -hmm. Aspen, Colorado, 70s, hunting, fishing his whole life, yep. just real tough. I mean, he wasn't violent by the time I was around, but when he was younger, he was. He was a big fighter and barroom brawler. I mean, he was just a tough... <laughs> I've never met a man as tough as him to this day. He, a few years ago, I went to visit him in Colorado. It was maybe three years ago. And we got a canoe and we're like way up above Timberline at some lake and we're going to row this boat across this lake and it's windy as hell. If you've ever rowed like a canoe, it is hard as fuck. And I do like a few strokes and I'm like, oh, I'm tired, dad. I can't do this. So my dad grabs the oars and just trucks us. Like, you know, he's like <laughs> 75. It takes us across the whole lake and back. It doesn't even break a sweat. I'm just like, you You're are like, the... I'll leave my manhood in the Yeah, canoe. <laughs> totally. I'm like, okay, my balls are in my pocket. Thanks, dad. Um, but yeah, he's just, he's just tough as nails. So, you know, for him, even though I, I didn't, you know, there was uh, maybe it's not as much warmth or affection or compassion or understanding and things like that, but I'm really tenacious and I don't give up and I go after what I want and I get it. I mean, I know how to get shit done. I'm effective and have a really good work ethic and things like that. So there were things that I picked up from my dad also. So my parents were spiritual teachers by default, but not because they lived a particular way. Mm -hmm. But as I've aged, I've been able to extrapolate the good parts of their influence and, you know, just the things that are in your DNA. I'm like a serial entrepreneur. My dad's never had a job in his life. So he never taught me how to do that, but I just watched him. I go, well, he doesn't have a job. I don't think I want a job either. It's, I would say it's like, there's like a human resources part of it. It's like you look at people and you see not necessarily the jobs they've had, but the skill sets that they have. So like it might not have manifested in a certain job for your dad, but there's a skill set that like you get from that which I think is so important if people would look at everyone that way and not necessarily the materialistic things that come out of those skill sets, it would be a whole different playing field for everyone. It's just totally. like acceptance, love, understanding, who you can learn from, who you can work, you know what I mean? Yeah. But so with your parents, were, when they divorced, how old were you when they divorced? I think I was three. So you were young. Yeah. yeah did we you live close or did We you? lived in Aspen. My mom was from California, went to Colorado, met my dad. They got married. We lived in Aspen. I think we lived there for a couple more years after they got divorced. And then we moved to Concord, California in the East Bay, uh, I think when I was around five or so. And all of you are just your mom and you. Me and my mom. And then yeah, and my dad lived there. Colorado. Yeah. So I grew up with the divorced parents, dad in Colorado, mom in California. And then when I was 13, I got sent to live with my dad because I was too unruly for my mom to handle. And, uh, and then after that, I only lasted a year there. And then I got sent to a boarding school and that was pretty much the end of like home life. Wait, so you said at eight, it's like <clears throat> when it all, you started just going the opposite way. What was yeah. it at eight that you feel like all of a sudden made you go? Well, it started when I was five or six, I was sexually abused by a babysitter. Hey. And um, yeah, a great gift, you know? <laughs> Did your mom know? No, she didn't know until many years later. I didn't tell anyone until I was about 14 when I was at this kind of cult therapy boarding school and then all that stuff came out. But yeah, that's when- Were um, you, did you know? Like, I know that's a stupid question, yeah, but yeah. I mean like how aware were you? Oh, I knew that, that it, it wasn't supposed to happen. Yeah, it wasn't particularly- overtly traumatic you know no one was like mean to me or I didn't get raped or something like that but it's highly inappropriate well, I mean, of course and, it's uh, still traumatic yeah and so you know that really like you didn't block anything out there. it's like you were aware and then just keeping yeah it totally yeah and, and from that point on I just short-circuited you know I mean it was so damaging to my psyche that I just completely kind of went off the reservation at that point and yeah I started vandalizing and lighting fires and reading porno angry. magazines and smoking cigarettes. I mean, I'm like six, seven years old. I'm already like getting kicked out of school. And it was very apparent that there was a... But your mom has no clue because she doesn't know that happens. She just all of a sudden sees you completely acting out. Yeah. That must have been also really hard for her to be like, what the fuck's happening? Yeah, totally. Totally, for sure. And yeah. you're too young to put the pieces together. Yeah. You know, it's interesting too. I, I didn't... You know, it's funny how these things happen and later on you unpack them as an adult and you think, oh, I've dealt with that, you know, because I mean, I've done so much therapy and personal development work and spirituality around that, that I could freely talk about it with you and it doesn't, I'm not triggered. It doesn't, I don't get emotional. I'm not suppressing or repressing anything. It's just, it's just a fact of life. It's something that happened in the, in the story, you know, but um, there have been times when I've looked back at that actually recently I was in Costa Rica at this place called Rhythmia and I did like four days of ayahuasca ceremony. I wanted to ask you about that. Yeah we can get into it but one of the things that happened during those ceremonies on one of the four nights when I had a lot of sort of 
cognitive awareness about different things and was able to time travel and go back in time as I really, really saw at depth how that situation had hurt me. So I knew that it hurt me because I could look at my behavior and, you know, look at what followed in my adolescent years and my teen years and into my twenties and just the path of self-medicating slash self-destruction that I had, but I really was able to see, holy shit, like that really, really hurt me. Can I ask like what that was that gave you this other depth of perspective? Just surrendering to what that medicine does to your soul and to your brain and allowing it to take me where it wanted to go. And And what was it? Was it a vision? Was it a feeling? Was it... It was just an awareness. It was an awareness. Yeah. It just kind of started from that moment on and went all through my life and reviewed. And I think, actually, I don't think I know healed the core of so many different traumatic experiences that I've had that one being, but in order for that to become more healed and who knows if one ever completely heals from these types of damages that, especially that happened before you're seven, you know, cause you're in a theta state, you're very your subconscious is being filled, you know, it's like a bank account that's being filled in the first seven years. And so when you have traumatic experiences before seven, they really lock in yeah. and the shame is just like eh, embedded. Uh, but by going back and the sense that I got was by really, really feeling the, the depth and the gravity of that situation and how bad I'd been harmed, that that was the means by which I was being healed in that moment, you know, and and it really did. I mean, I could feel it out as it was happening. Like, oh, I thought I really worked on this, you know, but it's like, no, the work is going, holy shit. That was extremely uncool. (laughs) Uh, And then, yeah. And then another thing that I learned about that recently that was really fascinating is I interviewed Mastin Kip. If you ever have a chance to have him on your show, God, I I didn't know that much about him. I, I just knew that I liked his work from what I was exposed to. Um, but he works on trauma, like that's his whole thing. And he was explaining how when you experience trauma like that as a kid, that the experience itself is traumatic, but then it's it gets compounded by you not having the ability to express it. So say, oh, yeah. Oh say yeah, so say I had experienced that and my mom came home and I was like, mom, this is kind of weird. Guess what happened? And then she could help me and I would have a chance to process that experience. It looked experience. very different. Yeah. And so the way he explained it, Ugh. it made so much sense is that you experience these, these levels of trauma that keep stacking onto the original one when you have to hold something like that. And it's a sense of um, abandonment, even though your parents didn't know and they're not trying to abandon you, you feel all alone and, and um, separate. And it makes it really difficult to uh, develop intimate relationships with people throughout your life because uh, you had no one safe around. Even though you might have, you didn't know that you had. So obviously, if I would have went to my parents and said, hey, this happened, I mean, God, they would have... But you're five. Yeah. And, um, and even in that um, ceremony too, I realized which I had never had the realization of it all I never blamed either of my parents for it, but I really had the sense that um, as a kid, I was deeply hurt because my dad wasn't there to protect me. Yeah. It's well, because as a child, the things we expect and put on, it's a different universe for us. And then as you just said, like as you get older, you understand how the universe really works and what people are capable of doing or not doing. But as a child, they're your parents. Like that's all you expect is them to be protecting you and I can only imagine as a kid. And he wasn't even close. He was far away. Oh, yeah. And, you know, when he found out about it, he expressed those feelings as well. Did he get rageful at all? Oh, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, for sure. Especially if that's his... Both my parents. I mean, they're just horrified, you know. But But I had never had the experience or allowed myself to feel those feelings. And that was another thing that happened in ceremony. I was like, holy shit. It's not something I hold now. I mean, my dad and I are super close. We're He's amazing. But... At some point, that part had hurt too. Of course. You know, and so, um, yeah, really interesting stuff. But, you know, this is the stuff that we have the opportunity to work through uh, in each lifetime. And that's how I look at it is this is, you know, your life's one long movie that goes on for thousands of years or however long and this is our souls. Right now. Yeah. So this is, this is one scene in one movie, boink, you know, and it's a pretty, uh, it's a big scene. It's a meaningful uh, plot twist. Right. And then I have the opportunity to use that as a catalyst for growth and healing. And as I uh, work on those things that are not fun to talk about sometimes and not fun to face, 
the emotional triggers related to those also fall away. Mm -hmm. And that's the good news about, you know, anyone that's gone through some uh, tough experiences like that in life, you know, especially when you're young because your subconscious is being programmed. And so you don't know that as an adult, the rest of your life, 90% of your actions, I'm sorry, 95% of your actions are based on subconscious programming while only 5% is actually your will. Like, I want to be happy. I want to have a good life. I want to make a meaningful contribution. That's only 5%. The rest of it is just programs running in the background, making us do shit until those- Reprogram. Yeah, until those subconscious um, programs are revealed and healed. We're just going to like have that Groundhog Day situation. That's such an interesting way to look at it. It's also empowering because we can- reveal them, we can heal them and we can reprogram them. There's so many ways, which I'm sure we'll talk a million, a million ways about it, but that is actually very an empowering way to kind of look at it. That like sometimes you're being controlled by something you don't even realize is happening. I have two questions about that from your past. Like one, how old were you when you finally told your parents? Like when did that come out? Well, I started getting in so much trouble as a kid who's experienced that would, I mean, yeah. how do you, you know, how do you hold that? I always say, luckily for me, there were a lot of drugs in my environment where I grew up, you know, in Northern California, as you said, in the eighties, I know that would have been the seventies and then the eighties. Yeah. yeah. All the hippies from the hate, basically <laughs> when that all came crashing down in 69, 70, which I was born in 70, uh, many of them migrated into the smaller towns up, you know, in North and all that. And so, there's a lot of drugs and a lot of drug dealers and bikers and hippies and ex hippies. And I mean, just, it was the thing. Everyone's parents grew weed. There was just- It was everywhere. Yeah, it was everywhere. So I'm thankful that I was at at least um, geographically located in a place where I could have some medicine. You know, so when I started to smoke weed when I was a kid, it was just like, oh my God, I can breathe. I mean, I felt at home finally. I felt safe if I was really high. It was the most amazing thing ever. Can I interrupt for a second? Yeah, anytime. Off of that, what do you feel like if let's say drugs, because the, there are people who say when you go through shit like this or certain scenarios, you either become like an addict, a drug addict, a sex addict, or you're like cutting yourself. I mean, it's one of, right. what do you feel like if you didn't have access to drugs? Because you're saying, thank God I had that. Yeah. It, you would have still needed something. What do you think it would have been? God, I don't know. I feel like I did everything <laughs> you can do. You know, I did, never got into cutting, but <laughs> I definitely had... Uh, I did a lot of really dangerous things for the for the high of it, you know. To when feel. I was a kid, yeah, yeah, I was really reckless. But I don't know, you know. It's tough to speculate. It, I guess, it would have depended on what was there. But yeah, I mean, the drugs were your savior. Yeah, drugs were my thing. But then, because when you're 14, it's difficult. You know, you don't have the funding to support your habit at a certain point, and you can only steal so much shit from the neighbors and things like that, <laughs> and then parents. You know, did you ever get caught? Yeah, well, that's what happened when I was, um, I used to case out all my neighbors when I was <laughs> like 12, Yeah, starting at around 12, I think. And, you know, everyone did drugs and around there, at least I knew the houses that did. And so, yeah, I would break into all the neighbors' houses, but I would go in and I wouldn't disturb anything. I would just like take some of what they had. I was hoping like, they wouldn't notice. Yeah, and they didn't, you know, so I wasn't like taking their TV. I would go through their doors and take some of their money and some of their drugs and stuff like that. And, uh, And then um, I was having problems in school, like always. And so my mom, she just, you know, God bless her. She had no clue how to deal with me. I just couldn't stay in school. I was getting expelled from everywhere and all that. So she sends me to live with my dad and he was ill-equipped to take care of a (laughs) drug addicted 13 year old. And so shortly after I got sent out to my dad's, um, he invited me to go one day. Uh, up into the high country and go horseback riding with he, with he and his girlfriend or a date or something. And I played sick because I had no drugs and I was like freaking out. And so he leaves and a buddy of mine comes over and we go and case out the neighborhood like I had explained. And we were like sneaking behind these houses and we saw some weed growing on someone's back porch, like behind a screen, you know, like a little greenhouse kind of thing. We're like, oh, they have weed. So we went and broke into that house. And, you know, just went through all their stuff and we couldn't find any weed, but we just stole a bunch of booze and like cameras and fireworks and just shit that a 13 year old would get off on. And uh, so we we went in and we did one round and then we carried as much shit as we could back to my house, which is a few houses away. 
And then we went in the garage and stored it on there. And then we had some brandy and stuff that we had stolen. And apparently <laughs> got pretty shit. I love shit. that these 13 year olds are drinking <laughs> <Yeah>. brandy. <laughs> yeah, apparently we got pretty shit faced because we were like America's dumbest criminals. Then we went back to the house to get the second load of stuff, which we had like compiled into this, you know. Um, you just left it in a pile? Yeah, in the living room. Yeah, because <laughs> we found everything we wanted and we just, you know, it was like a little interior garage sale kind of vibe. And then when we went back, the people came home when we were inside the house. <laughs> you want to talk about like your heart beating out of oh, your chest? Oh my god! That was one of the scariest experiences of my life because you don't you don't know if they're badass. Yeah, like, are they the person beat the fuck out the of the person you, that or? come home comes home could be badass and really fuck you up. Uh, fortunately for me, it was like a little skinny hippie, and he um, oh, it was the funniest thing. They had like okay, they had two front doors on this porch. And so I heard them coming in the front door. So I opened this door and I thought it was a closet and I was going to hide in there. When I opened the door, it was facing them. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> I'm like eight feet away from the people walking in the house. And I'm just like, shit. And they look at me and go, shit. And then I start running. And Did the they little... know you? Like, so they. No, no, not at all. And then the, the guy caught me. And he, I was chasing me down the train tracks. And I mean, I'm 13. I can only run so fast. He was a grown ass man. So he caught me. Dragged me back to the house and I came up with what I thought was a pretty plausible story. What was it? I'm dying The story was that my friend and I, because we were so young, like what 13-year-olds break into houses, right? So I said we were riding our motorcycles up on the hill and we saw these older teenage guys breaking into the house. And then when they left, we were so curious, we went down to go see what was happening. You were protecting them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and he was like, yeah, okay, tell that to the cops. And then the cops came and got me and took me to the Pitkin County Jail in Aspen. And Pitkin. So and I, was in, I was in jail. And so, um, you know, after that happened, then I got caught smoking weed at school. And then the courts uh, were going to kick me out of Colorado, basically. Well, I could have stayed, but if I stayed, if I had one more felony, um, I would have gone to the kids' prison. Um, until I was 18. And at that time I was 14. Okay. And I think I'd turned 14, 13 or 14. And so there, you know, the way it works is when you commit a crime like that, the justice system is interesting. They have all of these different felonies that they charge you with, you know, it'll be like grand larceny, breaking and entering, burglary, robbery, et cetera. And then you plea bargain out of it. So you have to admit to certain things and then they let other right. things go. You, so see you have this, a record, right? Yeah. And so they let me plea, plead, I said, plead, yeah. plead out of some of them. But then when I got caught breaking probation by smoking weed at school, they said, we're going to levy all of these charges against you if you do anything again. So you either have to clean up your act or leave the state of Colorado. We have a feeling that you're going to screw up again. This is the judge in yeah. Aspen telling me this. And he also had a big um, a hard on for my dad because they had like, known each other from the bar days or whatever, and they hated each other. So he was oh. like punishing my dad by being really hard on me. And blaming my dad for me being such a screwed up kid. And so, uh, so they, my parents made a decision that, that I needed to leave Colorado. My mom wouldn't take me back or couldn't take me back. You know, there was nothing she could do with me at that point. But as a kid, did that feel, was that a moment where you're like, nobody wants me? Even yeah. Now well, it. I didn't, yeah, I didn't realize that. So I got sent to this weird cult boarding school called Rocky Mountain Academy in Northern Idaho, out in the <laughs> middle of nowhere, which was like... I wasn't rich, but my dad was, he was fairly well off. My mom definitely wasn't. I mean, we were, we didn't have any money, but um, this was like Barbara Walters kid was there and Sam Walton of like Walmart yep. Waltons was there. And it was like a lot of rich screwed up kids, but I was like a poor screwed up kid. So it was an interesting experience. But was it for quote unquote screwed up kids? Oh yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Oh Got yeah. It. it was, a, it was, the doors weren't, that didn't have like fences or gates. It wasn't a, what we call a lockdown facility. <laughs> But it was so far in the middle of nowhere that you couldn't get away right. anyway. Go have fun. Go yeah, have fun. Yeah. So if you tried to run away, they would send these kid bounty hunters after you. So people like tried to run away. Yeah, oh yeah, all the time. Oh but God. they always got brought back. So I never tried to run away because I'm just going to get caught. And if I did, then I could have problems with the court back home because they worked out this deal. If I agreed to go to this disciplinary school for two years, that was a, you know, like a live-in school that I would likely avoid going to jail. So, um, so yeah, so. And that where everything came out? Yeah. Then I started, then I started dealing with all of that stuff, but it's funny cause I didn't realize what you just said that I experienced that as abandonment, but I didn't know that until I was much older and started doing Kundalini yoga and different things like that. I thought, holy shit. Yeah. I got the message first that my mom didn't want me. She sent me away. 
And then both of them were like, we don't want you. <laughs> and I got sent away, you know. Right. But at the time I was just terrified because I didn't want to be alone at some weird school out in the snow. I mean, it was freezing <laughs> out there. Um, and so, but that, you know, thankfully that school is controversial as it was. There's Facebook groups that are like not the alumni of Rocky Mountain Academy, but survivors of Rocky Mountain Academy. Wow. There's a whole thing with it, which we don't have time to go into, but there was a lot of pretty controversial practices and modalities of therapy and things like that, that they used, which I think was not great for some kids. But to me, it was a really um, positive experience because I got off drugs and I learned that stealing is wrong. And, you know, I got some semblance of self-esteem and things like that. They would do these things like wilderness challenges where they go send you off for three days in the mountains by yourself and you have to build God. a snow cave and they just leave you out there in the dark. And Jesus, it's like the military. <laughs> yeah. There was elements of that, like wilderness, you know, experience yeah. stuff for they do for, you know, wayward kids. And there was a lot of that, but it was a positive. So like a lot of therapy too? Oh my God. Yeah. Five days a week, group therapy. Yeah. Now at this point, like with your abuse, was it were you, a, I, this is such a stupid question, I know, but like, I guess my question is how aware of you, how aware of it were you? Or was it, you know what I mean? Like, was it something you thought about all the time or is it something, it was affecting every moment of your life, but you didn't quite, you weren't putting the pieces together? No, is, I think that, I was, you know I think I was saying? pretty aware. And I, I think that a lot of the shame that I experienced was a direct result. And I was aware of why I was ashamed. So the first you know? time it came out of your mouth, was that there at school? To yeah. Your, how, yeah. Was that the weirdest feeling to actually say the words? I don't remember the moment, but I don't think so because most of the kids that were there had had similar experiences and it was really common for these types of things to be talked about and it was worked into the curriculum. There were all these different workshops where they would use uh, sleep deprivation. Oh my God. <laughs> to, yeah, they'd keep you awake for 24, 36, 72 hours. And these- To make you more vulnerable. Yeah. And to make you, you know, uh, programmable, but in a positive sense, they would like do sleep deprivation to teach you the importance of love. And, right. you know, like they, they were well-intentioned, but um, there were all of these different exercises where you had to share at a group level, all of these things that had happened to you and everything you were ashamed of. And I think they had the right idea. They were pulling- practices from all of these different areas of pop psychology and est and all sorts of things that they had been into. But probably for you just to hear other stories was probably helpful for you to just share your own. At yeah, that age. yeah, totally. And like and, the whole thing was like, I'm alone. I don't know what to say. And then, yeah. And some people had had it much worse than I in terms of just you know right. the, the mechanics of the physical experiences they've had and things like that. I mean, there's all sorts of young girls that have been violently raped yeah, and sure. all Oops. sorts of gnarly shit where I kind of had the sense like, wow, I didn't have it that bad. Right. Uh, at the time, but it definitely was, it was, um, you know, a relief to be able to share that. But unfortunately within the programming at that school, they had no awareness or attention on the phenomenon of addiction or alcoholism. So I only got the moral understanding that it's not good for you to do drugs, you know, but I didn't know that I was already like a bona fide addict at that point. So when I got out, when I was 16, I knew that I wasn't supposed to do drugs, but I didn't know that like, no, you really can't even take one hit off a joint or have one beer right. or you're going to be fucked. And that's exactly what happened. The first time I smoked weed, it was like, it was, I mean, it was like catching a fever or something. I just immediately Got started back. doing acid, doing Coke, drinking every day. I just went completely nuts from day one. And so it's amazing that you're here and you moved out to LA, you were going yeah. nuts and crazy. And then I moved to LA when I was, when I was 19. Yeah. I moved to, um, and were you like, you were doing well though, right? I mean, career wise or no? <laughs> no, no, I had no career. My career was dealing drugs. Yeah. I was pretty good at it. I was going to say, but you were making money. Yeah, I was, I think I was well, us, using a lot of my profits, but yeah, I moved to, um, actually right on, uh, off of Highland where it was Golden Bridge and now it's Wanderlust. Yeah. I lived on, um, McCadden and DeLong Prairie right oh, yeah, there yeah. in a little craftsman house. And I moved in with a couple girls. They were like 30 and Oh, I mean, it was an amazing time. I mean, Hollywood Did in the 90s. Did you see 90s, that article that just went out? What article was that that just went out about partying in the 90s in Hollywood? Where was it? Was oh, it, I'd like I, to see that. I'll forward it to you. I was like, holy crap, this is a trip down memory lane. It was like, 
because the point of the article was more social media. And mm-hmm. it was about how social media has just fucked up nightlife in LA because before it would be like everyone famous would just go out and be out. And that was their moment to escape. And very few people have pictures of it or records of it because you could just be there. Now it's like, you, no one famous and stuff can do that. So it's just changed nightlife in general. So going through all the stories of all these famous people and where they hung out and what they did, you're going to die because you're going to be like, oh my God, I remember those nights at that club. Those ni-. like It's such a trip down memory lane if you're our I age would, and we're partying yeah. in Los Angeles. I would like to see that. I'll yeah. forward it to you. Yeah, it, I mean, it was a fun time because I was free of any uh, confines. I had no rules. Um, you know, all my friends that I started to make in Hollywood were older. Everyone played in bands. I started hanging around with all these musicians that I had, you know, had posters on my wall of them when I was in high school. And, you know, I was like, this is fucking awesome. All these, all the, I was popular with the girls. I was young and cute and I was having (laughs) a lot of fun, but like within two weeks I did heroin and within probably six months I started doing crack. And so it's pretty tough to win what with, was your rock with bottom? those recipe, the recipes that I was mixing, you know, that never ends well no. when you start delving into that stuff. A little weed, a few beers is one thing, but like, you know, um, I think, you know, it's just, I was playing music and when I moved to Hollywood, my dream was just to hang around musicians. I didn't have enough self-worth to think that I could ever do it myself. And then I met, uh, this guy, uh, Ron A, who is one of my old dear buddies, and he was from Finland. He played in this band called Smack that was like one of my favorite bands. And so he ended up teaching me how to play bass. I picked that just because it only has four strings and you, you, <laughs> you, you can get in a band fastest if you play bass. Nice. Like it's the easiest, to me, the easiest thing to learn to like get out and start playing clubs. So he taught me that and it was really fun. And we had a few brushes with success. You know, we had situations in which we, you know... Um, we're playing with some pretty famous musicians would guest with us or jam with us. And we were on, you know, decent bills with other bands and things like that. We had some big producers. We had a little record deal at one moment and wow. yeah, it would have been a good thing, but like everyone in the band were complete drug addicts. There was <laughs> three heroin addicts, one crystal meth addict, and all of us were like hardcore alcoholics. <laughs> so it was like six people that were just completely, influences completely fucked up. And everyone was a bit older than I. And I was kind of the band manager. I booked our gigs and made our flyers and did all that stuff. But, um, you know, the bottom was just the degrading behavior and situations that I started to put myself in. And just there's something about when, when you're doing something against your own will that's harmful, that just really tears down your moral fiber. So you know, tonight I'm, I tell myself, I'm just going to have a couple beers. Like I got to stop smoking crack, which is always good advice. You know, <laughs> no one's ever like, no, crack's cool. <laughs> you, know, you should totally do that. But I lived on, um, on Orange right behind the Chinese theater. And back then there was this area called the Yucca Corridor, which is like from Highland to Cahuenga, north of Hollywood Boulevard. It's still there, but yep. now there's like modern condos I and know. stuff. But this was like all the kids that went to GIT, which was the music school on Hollywood Boulevard. They all lived in these kind of cheesy 80s apartments right there. And they all had their parents' money. And so all the crack dealers from like the White Fence and 18th Street Gang all converged on that area. And that's why today there's still blockades that you can't drive through. Like if you drive down Selma, it has these big concrete things and they put those in because it was such a crack market. And so I lived, you know, five blocks away from that. I love this historical tour of Los Angeles. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> historical I mean, drug tour of Los Angeles. People don't understand, like they think Hollywood is still seedy. If you walked through that area, oh. I mean, there was crack dealers everywhere. No, Hollywood was, I mean, it's changed. I remember when it started changing. Yeah. You couldn't walk at all by yourself at certain times of night. No, it's totally changed. Yeah. So the, you know, hitting bottom was just progressively finding myself out at nine in the morning, walking up Highland and Franklin and hanging out with my homeless buddies. Cause they're the ones that have the one crack pipe between us. And I mean, I'm just like, who the fuck am I? I was dressed, I would dress like a homeless person so I didn't get mugged and carry around a hot coffee. That was my self-defense at getting robbed. And, you know, it's like, dude, it's hard to be repeating that kind of behavior and justify it. No, man, I'm just partying. Like there's no denial that will get you to think that that's a winning life uh, strategy. (laughs) But you brought yourself to rehab, correct? Yeah. My mom um, helped me get in once I called her. Yeah. But I mean, I guess what I'm like so in 
intrigued by is that's like a shit ton of self-awareness for someone who's doing that many drugs. Well, you know, I, I always had this, I think from going to that boarding school, I had this small seed of love for myself that was really, really small. But I knew on some level that I wasn't supposed to be living my life like that. And even when I was in the thralls of addiction, I knew that I was fucking up because I had been sober from 14 to 16. And I was, I was already full blown by the time I was 14. I mean, I was out of control and I got sober. So it was almost like at 16, I relapsed and, and relapsed for 10 years until I was 26. And I kind of knew that I was relapsed and I didn't have the words for it. I'd never been like in recovery or anything like that, or like in a 12 step program, I just knew like, "Mm, you're not really supposed to be a crackhead or a heroin addict. This is not a good look, but I couldn't get out of it. And that was fine. It's like this, when you're an addict, as long as the relief is there, if you're getting the anesthesia, you're willing to pay the price and the consequences, loss of family, loss of friends, you're unemployable, physical problems, illness, like... Because that moment of relief takes care of it all does, that Yeah, it does, it's worth it. Right. You know, it's like you could literally like have a scale and the benefits of getting medicated outweigh any of the detriments of your behavior. But there's a well, certain... because so getting medicated takes care of any negative feelings you're going to have. Yeah, yeah totally. Stuff. But it's true. It's like... But then there's a certain point where the consequences or the side effects of that coping mechanism start to heavily outweigh the benefits. And you don't have to be a rocket scientist at a certain point to go, hmm, wow, I'm really getting... And, you know, the short end of the stick here, this is like <laughs> very few benefits and the, the consequences are getting pretty dramatic. So the, really the bottom for me, it wasn't like, you know, I got thrown in jail or I got beat up or lost the apartment or tried to kill myself or anything like that. It was just the self-hatred and the shame oh, was awful. just, yeah, I mean, just, you know, walking around at nine in the morning, having been up all night smoking crack and like having people see you that you know, and you're like, fuck, I'm dressed like a homeless person right now. I'm walking around with a coffee to throw on people to try to rob me. Like this sucks. This is not feeling good. So it was just, you know, and then the band breaking up and losing the record deal and all those things started to fall apart. But it was, it wasn't like a single event. It was this feeling like I'm going a hundred miles an hour and I'm, I see that brick wall that we're looking at right there and it's getting closer and closer and closer and closer. And I know that I'm going to die or that something really bad is going to happen because I started to get much more reckless with legalities. But you didn't want like that. that to happen. No, which because is, there was which that. Which is good though, because some people don't care. Yeah. Well, I, like I said, there was that little seed seed of, God, maybe my life could be more meaningful than this, you know? And love, you said, and self-love. Yeah. you talk a lot now in general when you're like teaching or doing a lot about self-love, right? And self-respect. Yeah. It seems like it's that's- everything. It's everything. Yeah. Hey, you guys, just a quick note because we do get asked all the time, what are other things we can do? We have so many certifications. So if you're in the area and want to come and do some live, you should really check out our certifications. We have our big one. That is a 400-hour teacher training certification. That is incredible. Not only if you don't want to be a teacher, but if you just want to go deeper in your meditation practice where you learn about all lineages, we have all the Reikis, one, two, three, and master. We do intuitive healing, which is a longer program about learning how to read people intuitively and do readings. We also have an animal communications and a self passion, so many. My point is, check it out. There's ways to dig deeper into your practice. There's ways to get certifications. Go to denmeditation.com and take a look. Hey guys, our next Den Talks Live is this Thursday. Come join us. It's going to be at Den La Brea at 7.30 p.m. It's female bosses and we've got some amazing women for you. Kirby Bumpus of Sweet Green, Trace Vicosta, president of NBC Universal Entertainment, Sarah Gibson Tuttle, CEO and founder of Olive in June, and Sophie Sheesh, CEO and founder of Shape House. I promise you it's going to be fun, like usual Q&A, fun takeaways, wine and cheese. Hope to see you there. Just go to dentalkspodcast.com to reserve your spot. 
sorry for the interruption, but a little plug for one of our retreats coming up this May. We always are asked, how can I deepen my practice? How can I participate with you guys when I can't come to class? This is an Ojai. Please come. It's May 9th through May 12th. It is a silent retreat. It is with Heather Preet. So if you haven't listened to her episode, please go find it. She is our senior mindfulness teacher. She is incredible. These silent retreats are life-changing. I promise you amazing breakthroughs. It's incredible. So go to denretreats.com. Again, it's our silent retreat in Ojai, May 9th through May 12th. Don't miss it. But, you know, it's funny. I realized a couple of years ago, because I've, I've never been big on like plant medicine, psychedelics and stuff. I mean, I guess because I've been sober, I'm like, oh, that's fine for other people. But I've, you know, I did that shit in the nineties. I used to go see the Grateful Dead all the time and do tons of acid. That's a very good <laughs> story, by the way. Oh yeah. Oh, oh good. Really okay. Good. Hold that. I want to hear it. <laughs> so, um, it was never my thing, but I realized, you know, did I, I thought about, did I ever get any benefit out of psychedelics? And there was definitely one point the first time I took acid where I had an awareness of myself and the cosmos and what, it's too long to explain, but there was a aha moment that was more than just like, wow, bro, look at the colors. But then there was one night when I took, a, I used to sell mushrooms. That was one thing I did for a living. So I had, you know, just five pound bags of mushrooms. And one night I took a bunch of them <laughs> and, um, and I had, uh, this is at that apartment building behind the Chinese theater, which was called Disgrace Land. And that's what we named it because it was just full of vagrants and addicts. Disgrace and, Land. Oh, it was just, oh my God, this, this walls could talk in that fucking building. <laughs> but anyway, I'm in Disgrace Land, high as shit on shrooms. And I'm with my friend and we're supposed to be partying and drinking beers and hanging out and playing music. And I just start bawling and I just start crying. And I cried for hours. And I was like, dude, I have to get sober. I can't do this. I can't do this. Oh my God. And the mushrooms gave me the awareness that I was about to, it was not, I was not going to be around very long and I was certainly not going to accomplish anything in my life. And, and that actually was a catalyst. Now it was a few more months before I finally like, all right, I'm checking myself in rehab, but I, I do give credit to that one mushroom trip as um, an enlightening experience that helped me to see outside of myself and zoom out and objectively see me and my little pathetic life and how many people I was hurting and how hurt I was and that I was in such a dead end trajectory that that did um, act as a catalyst for me to just so stop all that shit. Because we've talked to a few people, obviously, who've gone through sobriety. And a lot of times there's that moment. Like we had Biet Simkin on here, who's amazing. And she talked about the same thing. She was like, pass out on her floor. I might be saying this story incorrectly, but she was like literally above herself looking down. And it was the same thing. She's like, what she all of a sudden saw was a total fucking addict who she's like, had no future, was going to die. Like she saw it from an outside point of view as well. And that's what allowed her to like change things. It's so interesting yeah. that it almost like something has to happen to have you look inside from the outside. Yeah, I think it happens like that when you, the veil of uh, denial and delusion gets pierced. Yeah. And you can, one day you just look at yourself in the mirror and you're like, oh my God, I'm a fucking loser. <laughs> you know, whereas before that, if people are like, hey, maybe you should, you know, sober up or maybe you shouldn't drink so much or do drugs. Like, fuck you, man. I know what I'm doing. But you know, it- it's just like, there's a, there's a defiance and an arrogance to, um, to a lot of, addicts and alcoholics you know i mean if you watch a show like intervention right i used yeah, to love watching that show because <laughs> you're just like dude can't you see and what a can. what a jerk you are the, you know the whole family loves them and you're destroying the whole family you're just like what bro i do what i want and you're like ah because they haven't had that moment of you know objectivity on their own experience and i think it does take that where there's just one it can just be like a millisecond of a moment where you're like oh shit i see myself and it's interesting because you've said it also in a way, not only do you see yourself, you saw the negative parts and you accepted it. Because we talk a lot about that here too, how that's just life in general. Like when yeah. you can accept yourself for its entirety, whatever that is, for the good parts and the bad parts and knowing you're working on these things and you love these things and you can brace both equally is when things start to flow for you. So it's like interesting that it starts even there with like addiction. It's like if you can just start accepting like, this is part of me and it might not be the best part of me, but it's part of me and that's okay because you can change it eventually as you go through the work. I know it's not easy, but like it seems like self-acceptance is a huge key to that too. Yeah. I mean, that's been for the past is 22 years uh, on February 15th. Just Congratulations. Last, last, yeah, last week or yeah. so. And, it, you know, the same phenomenon has 
happened with anything that's present in my life that's not serving me. So my relationship to money, to intimate relationships, to sexuality, um, just negative emotions that persist, being in fear and anxiety and worry or uh, being angry and hostile and impatient and anything within me that I've wanted to get rid of or stop starts with that little like, oh shit, I'm doing that. Oh shit, that's me. And it's there's this sort of tough moment where you have to really accept that that's where you are, even though you would like to be past that, but you're not. Yep. And that's a beautiful place to be is that moment of um, self-honesty and self-awareness because within that there is a modicum of humility and that's all you really need to affect change is just to go, okay, I am I see where I am in space and time and in my own development. And, you know, a lot of people think of humility as like not acknowledging your gifts and your good qualities too, which to me is what humility is all about. It's going, you know, you say like, hey, Luke, nice shirt. I go, yeah, thanks. It's fucking dope, right? <laughs> but it's not taking credit for it. It's acknowledging no, it's or someone would say, oh, you're a great singer or a great artist or you're so good at business or this or that, or I love your hair today or whatever it is. It's like owning that and owning your gifts is part of humility. It's just that you're staying right size so you don't get too big, but you also don't get too small. It's so funny. I remember one time, because I remember going through that too, of like, it's okay to say thank you sometimes and like things. And one time someone was like, you have like really pretty eyes. And my reaction was, oh my God, it's my favorite part about me. Like that was literally what came out. I'm like, I, and the person kind of reacted and then they started laughing. I'm like, oh, I can't believe that just came out. But I was like, wow, I've grown. Like the fact that I could say that and be like, I do love that about me. Like my, I, there's other things I struggle with, but that I love. So why not own that? Why not be okay with that? Yeah. Yeah, when it when it comes to overcoming an addiction or a bad habit or character defect, whatever, the very first thing that's necessary is to have that awareness and just to see that it's a problem. And I think why that works is because you have humility. When you have hum humility, it opens your mind to the possibilities that maybe maybe I could be another way. Maybe I could evolve past this, or maybe even just in the beginning, the acknowledgement that it would serve me and the people that I relate with. Um, to work through this. What's something recent do you feel like you've had that moment? Like you were saying, whether it's a relationship with money or a career or love or relate, like what is something recent that all of a sudden you've been like, oh fuck, like I'm doing that. I need to change that. <laughs> oh my God. Oh, there's so many. I mean, I'm in such a fun place right now. I've had just oh, so many things open up and so many things change for me. Um, that are meaningful, but I'll start like maybe it's about three years ago. I started to have all these problems around money where you know, I'm paying all this interest in credit cards. I used to be a fashion stylist and I'm not blaming my career, but it definitely for someone that's like had a lot of vagueness around money and just, ah, oh, whatever, just spend it. Who cares? Run up the credit cards. Like I just have never had a budget, never balanced a checkbook. If I feel like I'm low on money, I hustle, I make some money, I go spend it all, I spend too much. Like I've just not been responsible or aware around money. And I think used, I mean, to get a little deeper psychologically, used shopping and buying things as a high. And mm -hmm. then it's this negative feedback loop of then feeling guilty and afraid because I spent that money that I wasn't supposed to. It's been like a habit through my whole life. And Three years ago or so, uh, I realized I was like $100,000 in credit card debt. I never looked at the fucking statements. I mean, I wow. always, I've always had good credit. Like I always pay my bills, but I would look at the interest and it would be like $350 this month. And I'm like, ouch, ouch. It's this really painful realization. At one point I was paying $1,000 a month in just interest. Right. It's crazy. And that went on for years. But when you're a fashion stylist, the way that that works is you use all of your your credit cards, which is why I had like a big line of credit. And then you pay for, you know, the wardrobe expenses and stuff, and then your client reimburses you. So if it was just left up to me, I probably wouldn't have stacked up that much debt. But what would happen was I would get reimbursed by a client and then I would just put that money in my checking account and then and not pay the credit card. Yeah. And I'd have like, I'm like, oh, sick. I have 25 grand in the bank. Someone would be like, hey, want to go to Brazil? I'm like, fuck yeah, let's go. <laughs> you know, I got money. No, you don't have money, dude. So it's just a lot of confusion and vagueness around mm -hmm. money and fear of numbers and math and banks and taxes and all that stuff. And so as I started to become more kind of emotionally 
and mentally sober and not wanting clutter like that in my life or any ambiguity or vagueness about anything, uh, I started to really have to face the money stuff. And so three years ago, I started working on paying off my debt and I paid all that off last year and have not since um, ever bought something that I don't have money for. I cut up all my credit cards, paid all that shit off. Do you have credit cards now? Do you use credit cards? I have two business cards. Mm -hmm. I have a business called School of Style that's a fashion school for stylists. And we have a JetBlue mileage card. And then for my own business, the podcast and stuff, I have another one. But other than that, I only pay cash. Um, And so that's been very freeing to just... I don't know, to your average person, they're like, uh, duh, of course you don't have debt. Like my dad, he's never been in debt in his life. I remember years ago, he was really annoyed. He's been in real estate and stuff. And um, he was really annoyed because he had to take a loan out for this one property. And I was like, well, that's how people buy properties. He's <laughs> like, uh, not if you're smart, you pay cash for everything. Fuck interest. And my dad's been that way his whole life. My mom, never been in debt. It's always really been good at budgeting money. I'm like, where did I get this fucked up money gene? That's interesting. Yeah, but it was, you know, deep, digging deeper into it, there was a lot of like self-sabotage and just weird, you know, not really conscious motives behind all of that stuff. So as I really started caring about my life and my sense of well-being and loving myself more, that started to become glaringly obvious. It's like, wait, I'm sober all these years. I'm working on myself spiritually. Why is this? This is a spiritual lesson. And so what what I started to see was that this currency of money is a spiritual principle, right? Whether it comes in the form of a dollar bill or, you know, yeah. A couple thousand years ago, a fucking goat or whatever. That's your currency. And that's, you know, a monetary value that the universe or God has bestowed upon you. And you're the steward of those resources. And it's like, it's just, it's a spiritual principle that you don't borrow anything that you can't pay for, including charging something on your credit card that you don't have the money for. It's just, you're breaking a universal law. And there's a price to pay in terms of the confusion and the the discomfort that comes along with living in debt to someone or to the universe. It's funny, you just said something about A, being a steward. And also you said something earlier about, you know, in being humble, like these are just the things you have. And, you know, a lot like in Kundalini, we study Kundalini together. And then Reiki, I mean, so many, anything usually in the spiritual world, it's always like we are the vessel. So like, it's okay to love what you're doing, but that's the difference of humility. It's not taking credit for it because it's not necessarily you. It's coming from <laughs> totally. a higher power. But it's interesting because totally. you've alluded to it a few times. Do you feel like, A, you live that way? Do you act on it? And when do you feel like that clicked in for you? If you do live that way. Well, you know, it really is from... it's it's. I always laugh when you talk about the word humility because it's almost as if it's one of those principles that if you talk about it and try to explain what you know right. about it, you're not humble, you right, know, right, right. in a sense. But it's just a joke. Like I always say, like, you know, I'd talk, I'd give my talk on humility. You're but like, I'm super humble. Yeah, but I'm, I'm probably the most humble person in the room. So like, but uh, no, it's, you know, it's acknowledging, it's acknowledging your talents, acknowledging your skills, but knowing that it didn't come from you, right? Mm-hmm. So if someone says, oh, wow, man, you you really play guitar well or you write well or podcast well or whatever, to me, that's great. Wow, thank you so much. But I literally did not create this body that I'm riding around in. I didn't even make my soul. I didn't make my brain. I didn't make my hands. I didn't make any of this. So it's all given to us. So to take credit for it and to allow your ego to feed on it is a fool's errand because none of it is you. The only thing maybe you have is your will that guides your behavior and guides your areas of interest or practice. And maybe you hone a skill and your will allowed you to do that. But the fundamental talent that anyone has in any given area is given to them as a gift. So to take credit for it and get boosted by that is pretty silly if you think about it in that way. If anything, we we get in the way more than... <laughs> yeah, totally, do you know what I mean? It's totally. like if you're saying you have this will to hone this skill, but it's also like our will is usually what fucks us all up. It's like yeah. we get in the way. We're all probably... Like we're all given these amazing gifts or these powers to be these beautiful selves. And then we all get in the way and kind of screw it up usually Yeah. versus just kind of accepting it and letting it flow. And then the problem is like what you're just saying is then when you learn to accept it and let it flow, how do you then not take credit for it and go on a whole different path? It's like that, you know, pendulum, like getting in the middle there. That's the weird thing about 
spiritual pursuit is that the ego is always waiting at bay, ready to take credit for anything. So yeah. you, you start to have some success in meditation, right? Mm-hmm. And then the ego's like, I'm dope at meditating. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, you really have to be vigilant because I don't demonize ego. I'm just aware of it. It's like, it's like a pet, you know, that's doing its job to keep the body alive. And I'm very grateful that I have an ego. And, and it's tricky. It's tricky though. But you got to watch it. It's it's very cunning. Let's talk about that a little bit. Because I do think the ego is very tricky. I've had like, in my meditations, I feel like that's a lot of what I'm dealing with lately is just really struggling with my ego. And not in the typical sense people would think, more in like what it wants, what it's fighting me against, what I'm supposed to be doing, what it's telling me not to do. You know what I mean? It's just the struggle of like, letting living within the flow kind of and living within yourself and let and listening to the ego but like letting it kind of be on the side. So what is like your advice or things that you feel like when you're talking about ego of rec- a recognizing it? Like how do you recognize for some people out there it's voice versus other voices, you know what I mean? It's voice versus your own voice that's actually coming from within. And then once you can recognize that, how can you start the balance shift or, or petting it like a pet, like you said, like respecting it and keeping it there, but not letting it guide you or win all the time. Well, I think it's really useful to recognize that part of our personality, our psyche for what it is and to make peace with it first off. A lot of religions use the term sin to describe everything that the ego does. It's crazy. Yeah. When you think about it that way, that's crazy. (laughs) Yeah. And so there's, at least in Western culture, anything that, you know, we don't call ego, ego, unless you're like in the spiritual scene or psychology or something like that. But it's like when somebody misbehaves and is acting on their lower nature, their animal nature, they're bad. Uh, And, you know, to the degree that they get locked up if they're doing too much of that, right? If they're too inappropriate. In other words, if they have too much ego, they're going to get shut down. So I was kind of caught in that trap for a while where let's say, um, let's say I was, uh, you know, someone insulted me or so I thought, like somebody maybe put me down or said something disparaging against me. And then I would go on the attack or the defense and want to put them down or hurt them back or something like that. And then because of building some self-awareness through meditation and things like that, which I'll talk about, I would go, oh God, I'm such a jerk. I can't believe I got angry. Oh, I'm such a jerk. I intentionally hurt that person. And then it's like this uh, double jeopardy feedback loop where the ego motivates me to do something that I normally wouldn't do because it has a certain sort of inertia and power. And then I have an awareness that that's what happened. And now the ego comes back and says, see, you are a fucking jerk. (laughs) You know what I mean? It sucks. It's really, it's tricky because it makes you do stuff and then you realize you did it. And then it comes back and kicks you in the ass again. Right. Yeah. So it's funny because Marion Williamson always says, and I'm getting it wrong, but basically like you, you, even if you're firing a defense because someone fired first, you're still firing. Like, it's like you're still throwing the weapons and you still have the cannon. So you're equally to blame. And I love that. Like that opened my mind in such an interesting way because it was like, yeah, it doesn't matter if someone, you know, threw the rocks first. It doesn't matter. It's like the fact that that's your version of retaliating means you're just as guilty. Yeah. A war against war is still war. It's still war. <laughs> Byron Katie says, uh, she says, defense is the first act of war. Fast is good. It yeah. is good. So, so some of the tricks uh, of the ego that I've observed, you know, and this helps to just like, love and accept the ego for what it is, is something that's there for your own preservation. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because its job, as I see it, is to fulfill the instincts, right? To make sure you have sex, to make sure that you get approval from your tribe, uh, to make sure that you have food, to make sure you have security, the things that the body needs. Uh, The ego's job is to do that. Unfortunately, while it's very cunning and clever, it's also really dumb sometimes <laughs> and goes about it in ways that don't serve you or anyone else. It does a really horrible job of that. But how I, um, you know, just, well, first by saying, I guess, how to build that awareness, I think comes a lot from really studying spiritual teachers and spiritual literature and listening to tons of audiobooks and podcasts about people talking about 
um, human nature as it relates to ego and your higher self versus your lower self and just getting familiar with the basic concepts of it Mm -hmm. and then developing a practice. I mean, meditation is obviously the ultimate practice for that because you're sitting there in meditation and then you have, say, an epiphany or an awareness about your behavior earlier that day and you see yourself behaving in a way that is dissatisfactory, even embarrassing to you. Well, who's the one watching that? And that's the key distinction is that witness perspective where you can see a, another you. It's not me that's seeing me. It's me that's seeing it. Right. That's seeing the ego or aspects of myself. And that's really difficult to do when you never stop and slow down and you just continue to feed the parking meter, go do the thing, you know, stop over here, running errands, living your life, having your relationships, talking to your family, da, da, politics, TV. Da. There's so much noise that we become or we believe that we become the ego and you can just throw throw kind of the intellect and the mind in there. But when you stop and you have a meditative practice, which I've had for 22 years in one form or another, it's like incrementally, little by little, having that sense of awareness so it's not only on the cushion in a beautiful space like we're in right now, but perhaps after this conversation, I'll walk out to my car and maybe like a guy will walk too close to me and I'll have this sense like, fuck you. And I want to hit him. Like, seriously. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, those impulses still come up. I'm like, who the fuck you think you're? Dude, you're too close. Or right. somebody's too close to my car. I'm being threatened in some way. Because I meditated or we had this conversation, then it's like before it even becomes a thought, it's just a slight sensation that there's a threat. And now I want to defend or offend or whatever the case may be. And so the meditative practice becomes more of a contemplative practice where there's yeah where there's a sense of stillness and global awareness and an objective zoomed out point of view even as life is really busy and you're driving down the road really fast and you're running late for that appointment but you can still see the thoughts you still experience the sensations of emotions and feelings you still see the drives of the ego the motives of the ego but you're not at at its Second call. Yeah, you're not at its mercy because of the awareness. The awareness is what gives you the power to work with it rather than fighting against it or just blindly being driven by it. But it goes back again to what you were talking about earlier, which I think is fascinating, is this ability of stepping out. And it's like getting the aerial point of view, yeah. which is so cool. It's like, again, in this area too, you're literally saying like having that moment of being able to see yourself from like a witness perspective. So whether it was that moment of getting yourself off the fucking ground and off drugs, or it's a, or it could be as simple as like, hey, look how you're reacting to this person. The ability to see yourself is huge. Yeah. Yeah. Some of the things that, that I observe, so I'm thinking of, there's kind of the framework of, you know, I think how I and some others start to get a little separation, a little gap between the me and the it yep. is... Anytime I find myself wanting to defend a position, anytime I want to prove that I'm right. Oh yeah, that's always the killer. Those those are pretty good indications. Uh, Anytime I want to punish. Yep. Anytime I'm afraid that I'm going to lose something that I have or that I perceive that I have. I love these little practices. This is actually really great for people because I feel like we talk about this so amorphously sometimes, but for you to literally be like, these are the emotions that signal that you're actually not having the ability to kind of see yourself. Yeah. Anytime I feel the need for other people to like me. Yep. And again, there's nothing wrong with being liked. There's nothing wrong with having sex, getting food, all the things that the ego wants you to have. But without the awareness of when that's in charge, um, another one that's big is comparison. Yep. I'll, I was just talking to a friend of mine last night and she was telling me how she's compared herself with other people in her career and things like that and how it doesn't feel good. And I said, yeah, I totally know what you mean. I'll like, I'll look at Tim Ferriss's downloads of his podcast and I'm like, I'm a loser. I totally suck. (laughs) And, you know, meanwhile, ignoring the fact that- And we do that for yours. That he's he's been doing, he's been doing what he's doing for like 20 years. I started a podcast two years ago and I want to be where he is already, which, you know, on one plane of reality is totally possible. But if I'm, if I'm like, comparing myself with him, it's different than setting a benchmark and a goal. Like, wow, Tim Ferriss, man, he's crushing it. I'd like to have those many down, that many downloads. What can I do to empower myself and really work hard and 
My thing Be is always like, strategic. stay in your own lane. That's what I always say. My team yeah. hears me say all the time. I'm like, we just stay in our own lane because the minute you're like looking at all the other lanes and it's like what <laughs> yeah, we were talking about yeah. earlier, if you're in it and you're connected to yourself, you will be taken care of exactly what your podcast or my podcast or anything we're doing is supposed to do. So I'm always like, if I just stay in my lane and I do it the way we feel like we're supposed to be doing it, it will like the car will get to exactly where it's supposed to get to. I feel a lot better when I operate from that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, you can torture yourself. Yeah. Um, Comparison. Comparison. <laughs> at, at one way. point, I was talking to a, um, a woman that I've been dating, and we were talking about money and things like that. And she, this is another like observation of ego. I mean, you know, men and women, I think, you know, to generalize, we have certainly our trigger points. For sure. Uh, I mean, I don't, like, I have a little bit of a gut. It doesn't like bother me much. It's me like, too. I look in the mirror and I'm like, ah, oh, God, I kind of wish I had a six pack, but, you know, I love ice cream, whatever. I'd rather <laughs> eat the ice cream than have a six pack. But I'm maybe, you know, <laughs> but, you know, I've observed with having women in my life, if they had what I have, they would be freaking out. I'm like, what? What's the big deal? So we'll have our things that we kind of freak out about. But anyway, I'm talking to this woman and she was like talking about money. And she said, well, yeah, I mean, I've dated some guys that are really, really wealthy and just have so much money. And I was like, I'm a loser. That's ego. Right. So I immediately compared myself with them. Meanwhile, ignoring the part where she said, and they were jerks. They, they hated what they did for a living. They were miserable. It's like ego doesn't see that. Ego gives you selective well, hearing. Yeah. And it's job in nature. If you think about an animal, it's always scanning the environment to, for danger, for threats, or for benefit. And it has to do that by sizing everything up. Threat? No, not threat. Am I higher than that? Am I lower than that? It's just a mechanism of ego. It's always in comparison. So if I have the awareness when she says that, I'm like, oh, there's a little feeling in my body that's like, ow. But because I'm not used to feeling ow most of the time, when there's a little ow, it's like immediately I inquire, what is that? And I go, oh, I feel less than those guys. I mean, it's immediately psychologically available to me. And then the next step is, well, what else did she say? <laughs> and she said, she's not with those jerks. She's, she's with, with you, you, right? So A, she doesn't care. Otherwise, she would be with some rich guy who's unhappy versus you, Mr. Happiness, doing what you love for a living and, and you know, doing better financially all the time also. But that comparison, I think for me, is a really good little um, warning sign that, that ego's coming in. And then, as I said, becoming defensive. So, you know, let's say to you, I, I come in here and you're... Um, you know, you're like, hey, we're running a little late. And then I get all freaked out because I want to set up my stuff. And then I'm like, well, it's because I had to do that. And I start making up excuses or stories and I'm just like defending some sort of position. You know, it's like, that's ego. Right. I love that. I feel like even it's going to be interesting. There's going to be a million times tonight where I'm going to be like, ego, ego, <laughs> yeah. ego. Well, it's, it's fun though. And when I see it, I just kind of then like, it like it's a, yeah, I'm like, hey, <laughs> thank you. Good job. Good job. But I got it from here. We're cool. <laughs> yeah. we're, we, we're not, you know, we're part animal, but the higher self, when the higher self is tapped into intuition and grace, then survival is automated. You know, you just put one foot in front of the other and you have a great mate and you have some food and you have shelter and you have a meaningful career. And like the more I follow spirit and just trust in the divine intelligence of God, it's like the ego's job isn't really necessary apart from, you know, doing laundry and making sure you take a shower every once in a while. You know what I mean? Like My it's, ego needs to step up then. You know, <laughs> <laughs> but you don't really, you don't need that much ego. You need just a healthy amount of ego yeah. that enables you to you know, find your place in the world in terms of having a personality and a person. I mean, I have a huge ego, but I'm aware of it and I use it to my advantage and use it to help people. I have a big personality and do all these public things and these podcasts and videos and speaking. Yeah. And if I had no ego, I would be in a cave in the Himalayas fucking meditating and not out in the world. I tell people that all the time. Doing my thing, you know? So I'm just, I'm aware of it and I try to use it for good and not evil, you know? Yeah, I always say, use your powers wisely. <laughs> yeah, totally. So I'd be remiss if I didn't talk to you at all about all the biohacking before we go. Yeah. So obviously it's what you do. You're like a human, you know, experiment at all times. <laughs> you should see the thing that just arrived today in the mail. Oh my God. And people must send, you must get packages all the time. Well, this was three packages that are like, that, <laughs> I mean, like the size of a dog house, I guess would be a good comparison. What size dog though? Just... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Maybe not my dog. Uh, I mean, it's like a $15,000. It's called a biocharger. And I discovered these things, this thing years ago. And I was like, well, I, you know, I didn't have the money to just 
flagrant, flagrantly drop 15K on something that just makes you feel good and heals you. But then I went to uh, Tony Robbins' date with Destiny a few months ago and I walk around the corner and there's a whole field of biochargers. They're there at his event. I start talking to them. We're like, oh, Tony's been using these things for years. He has one in each of his houses. And I'm like, Tony's no slouch. I mean, he's a smart guy. Right. If he's down with these, I'm down with these. And um, I used the device to get me through date with Destiny, which is like a sleep deprivation nightmare. I mean, it's a beautiful experience, but like you don't sleep and I don't do well without sleep. So every day I do that biocharger. And so- And it just, I mean, what does it do? Oh my God. Well, I had the guys on my show to explain what it does and I probably can't do it justice at all, but um, it uses um, Nikola Tesla technology, noble gases, uh, an electrical field and a pulsed electro, wait, what's it called? Pulsed electromagnetic field. Essentially- it creates an insane amount of energy that's healthy energy and it ultimately charges your cells. So your wow. cells are electrically charged. Do you feel it immediately or is it like oh, yeah. immediate? It's like, oh, a char- yeah. it's like literally yeah. a charge. Yeah, and <laughs> I'm doing an event at uh, Rama on Saturday and I just realized like, oh shit, I'm going to get this. They're coming to set it up tomorrow and I'll bring it to Rama because you can, a bunch of people can use it at once. It's, I mean, it's huge. It's is like, it, is this like, are we becoming aliens and we're plugging ourselves in? Essentially, yeah. Amazing. But I love I'm, it. But they I'm, know they're laughing because they know the minute we start talking about aliens, I'm very excited. But in my, in my <laughs> workshop, I'm going to like have everyone, we're going to use it in the workshop. It's in it. It makes lightning like Ooh. you can hold a fluorescent light bulb in one hand and like get one hand close to it and light the can light bulb. Can I ask bulb. a dirty question? Yeah. Because I know you're in a relationship. Yeah. Have you tried it yet? Like before sex? Like has it changed? I just got it. Okay. Well, um, I, need, I have to know. But I course. will. I mean, you could have sex in its field. That would be kind of epic actually. I'm curious. Yeah. I mean, you could put it on the bed <laughs> or anywhere <laughs> where you can have sex. Yeah. You could put it on a table and like your girlfriend will thank me later one for could putting be, this in your head. <laughs> one could be bent over in the field of the, the biocharger and probably have a great time. I love it. Um, no, but there's other things that work great for sex. Like um, what? Pine pollen. Interesting. Pine pollen extract from Sith Rival. Yeah, it really um, boosts your testosterone in men and women, which is great. It basically, pine pollen is the sperm of pine trees. And so it has a biocompatible testosterone in it. Another one that's really good is juve red light therapy. Yep modulates your hormones, boosts testosterone, um, and makes you pretty. Ooh, done. Let's yeah. order some, Nicole. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what do you feel like? So, I mean, I, you, I don't even know if you know the number of things yeah. you've experimented with, but like, it's a lot. Oh my God. It's, I'm sure it's a huge wow. number. But what is, if there's like one or two takeaways of the things that yeah. are like become... Because, and this goes into two things. A, I want to know the actual things, but B, I also want to know and talk about the difference of like trends and just having fun and experimenting with a bunch of stuff and the idea of actually incorporating something into your life. Like, and what you do obviously is you're like sampling things for people in order to help people kind of make those choices, I'm assuming. Yeah. And I'm sure your messaging, like I know your messaging is very much like, it's not about just being frivolous with trying a million things. It's like coming up with what's really going to help you. Like, correct? So there is a difference. So I want to like chat about that and what things have you like really incorporated into your like your life that have changed you? First, I want to say just my motive for all of this was to get well after I got sober because right. I was half dead. I mean, I was 135 pounds. I'm 6'2". So I was jaundice. I was yellow. I, I mean, I ate garbage. I was so unhappy. I had bad skin. Probably looked older at 26 than I do at 48. Probably. I was a wreck. So that's how I got into all that stuff. And then I got into herbalism and cleansing and detoxing and all this kind of stuff just because I started to study it and I would feel better and better the more stuff I did. Fast forward to now, um, it's sort of a novelty. I just love these crazy devices yeah. and these new inventions and all this cutting edge biohacking stuff. And now there's even a word for it. It's just crazy. You know, biohacking that didn't exist a few years ago. And I've taken every supplement and every herb and all that stuff. But I have to say, to just break it down to core fundamental issue is that why human beings are sick physically and why there's more disease now than ever, even though we have more technology than ever before, is just so simple. And that is that we have become domesticated. Okay, so... We sleep in a box, we do interviews in a box, we walk out to another box with wheels, we drive to another box. We're completely cut off from our natural environment. And that makes a, an organism sick. Mm -hmm. So it's like when you take a lion from the Sahara and throw it in the San Diego Zoo, it gets fucking sick. It always makes me so sad. Because it's, 
it's not in its, its natural habitat. Yeah. Well, we're not in our natural habitat. And so what does that look like? That looks like chronic degenerative diseases because the inputs from nature that we need, um, primarily light from the sun um, and fresh air and being connected to the ground are missing. And also just, I mean, from a kind of a little more esoteric standpoint, but there's no right angles in nature. Even being inside a building is confusing to your biology because there's no squares in nature. It doesn't exist, I right? I love that. Yeah, so... So like into like a biodome idea of like yeah. that being the future. So the fundamental issue is that we're cut off from the elements. We live at 68 degrees, most of us, our entire life. We never get very cold. We don't get very hot, right? We're just cozy, cozy, domesticated zoo animals. We're human zoo animals. So that's the fundamental problem you have there. Which animal are you? <laughs> I'm trying to figure that out. In my former life, uh, a few years ago, a dog would have been appropriate perhaps, but um, now I don't know. Um, I feel pretty... Um, I feel... Um, like, um, well, maybe another kind of dog, a loyal, a loyal dog, not a horny dog. Um, <laughs> but, uh, so there's all these devices, there's all these supplements and stuff like that. And everyone wants to know, you know, what's the new shit? Like what, like a friend of mine just texted me, Hey, my girlfriend's sick. What vitamins should she take? And I'm just like, dude, she needs sun. When's the last time she was outdoors? Yeah. When's the last time she was below 68 degrees or above a hundred degrees? Um, what our problem is, is that we live not only cut off from the environment, but we've created a fake environment called blue light like that, like that LED light right there. We're killing ourselves slowly. Well, no, but you know, you have to stay positive. That's the thing. You know, it's like, I am into awareness, not fear. Right. I agree. So there's Wi-Fi in this building. Wi-Fi fries you. It's radiation. It's fucked. You should never be in Wi-Fi, but guess what? We are. So what are you going to do? And that's today. You, you like, e- there's almost no way to avoid you it. You either make a decision to move in the middle of the goddamn mountains somewhere and you know barely have electricity and live the dream, or you find a way to live in the city and mitigate it. But like that light right there, when I always try to explain people, because they're like, well, what's the big deal? Okay, the first thing is <laughs> through our evolution, 2 million years, whatever, right? And everyone has a different number. 2 million years of one version, maybe 200,000 years of this version. I'm not an anthropologist, but... And I'm not going to correct you. For a long goddamn time, <laughs> the only light human beings saw after dark was moonlight, starlight, Stars. and firelight, right? Mm-hmm. Well, with the advent of the incandescent light bulb, 1780, 1876, whenever it was, um, we have the ability to make it daytime at night which is amazing. What we don't realize though is the consequences of your system. messing with nature because when your eyes look into a light like that at night, it sends a message to your brain that it's daytime and what happens is it shuts down the production of melatonin and starts the production of cortisol within seconds. That's how intelligent your body is. Um, we're light beings. We're actually walking solar panels and even your whole body, um, your entire skin organ has photoreceptors on it that take in information about the light. So with that light right there that we're looking at, which is a great studio light, and I'm glad you have it because ring lights make you look sexy. <laughs> but see how it's very, very bright blue? Yeah. It's like right, like white blue. At. Yeah. So um, that actually, that spectrum of light is so narrow within a certain spectrum. It doesn't even exist in nature. The sun doesn't do that. So when we're in here, our brains are going, what the fuck is that? But we don't notice it because it's like, oh yeah, it's just a light. But over time, with repeated exposure and chronic exposure for however many hours a day you're in a light like that, um, it wears on your on your biology, specifically your circadian rhythm. So when people want to know, like, what's the one thing I can do is you have to get natural light in your eyes with no sunglasses, no contacts, no glasses, no windows in your car, no windows on your house. You have to get outdoors and get bright light around you. Do you drive a convertible? I, I have a sunroof and I have it cracked all the time just to get natural light in. So you just moved. We were talking about yeah. that. Thank when God. When you were choosing your new environment, like what came into play? That's why I moved. I oh, moved really? to Laurel Canyon. Yeah, because I was living down in the city and I didn't know, but I was living under two giant cell towers for three years and I had all these health problems and I couldn't figure out what the fuck it was. And I'm like, I'm Mr. Biohacker. Why do I? I'm <laughs> like, I'm dizzy all the time. My vision got all crazy. I have headaches. Went to all these specialists. I tried everything. And then one day I went into the office building across the street. I think I was like guided to go up there to light a fire under my ass to move. And I walk on the roof and there's these two giant cell towers that were hidden behind a wall so I couldn't see them. 
But when I checked the radiation levels in my apartment, it was like being in Chernobyl. I mean, it was insane. I was so gnarly. So I had to find something that was out of that. And that's why I moved to Laurel Canyon. Now I'm dealing with the issue of like, my phone doesn't work. (laughs) I got so far from the cell towers, I have no phone service. So now I have Wi-Fi in the house, which is the lesser of evils in terms of, you know, radiation. But- um, Do you go by candlelight at night? I, You know what I did is I have all the bulbs in my house are all orange. So it's like, yeah. Yeah. The lady friend uh, I'm hanging out with at the moment is not <laughs> a big fan. Yeah. Um, it's not the most like, it's not the coolest as far, but I get yeah. it. Yeah, well, it's just, it's dim at night. Yeah. But to me, it's just, it's- That con- makes everybody look good. I feel Dude, like- <laughs> Yeah, right? I know. Yeah. You don't see, you know, any blemishes uh, or anything. Um, But it, when it gets dark outside, to me, it's been just years now. I'm in the habit when it gets dark outside and you see that kind of amber color in the, you know, in the sunset um, time, then I just make it that color in the house. It's just like- Do you go to bed early? Simple. Are you like a to bed dark? Like rock? I wish I was. Um, the num- You know, I'll give you the number one biohack in the world. Please. And this is, I just did a podcast about EMFs and 5G and blue light and all this with Jack Cruz. It's three hours long and he explains it scientifically from quantum biology. I mean, like real hard science. But if you wanted one health practice that was going to move the needle more than anything else, it's watching the sunrise and sun gazing every morning. Because that sets your entire biology clock, your biological clock, your circadian rhythm. And there's light that's present in that morning red light Wow, that fuels your mitochondria and all, well, not all, but many diseases we have are mitochondrial diseases. In Mm -hmm. other words, you have a lack of electrical charge. You have a lack of energy and that sunlight in your iris literally charges you like a battery. You got to do it safely. Don't go out and stare at the sun. I'm talking about like when right, it's low, when yeah. it comes on the horizon, the first 15, 20 minutes, it's so far away and it has so little UV that it doesn't hurt your eyes, but medical disclaimer, like go study sun gazing, don't just do it. But um, that's the number one thing. That's doable. So what's yeah. the one thing you feel like you've taken into your life every day out of all these well, things? Well, that, but now the thing that catches with my new can't place, I can't see the sun because I'm in the canyon. Yeah. So and now the sun rises at 6.30 and I'm a night person, dude. Like I can stay up till two every night. No problem. I mean, I have so much energy, 11, 12, 1 a.m. I'm on fire. In the morning, I get a slow start. So it takes a lot of discipline for me. But in my last apartment, I had an eye line on the sunrise. And I did it for about a week. And then I started popping up 7 a.m. every day, wow. wide awake. Yeah, I was like, holy shit, this actually works. It can change you from being a night person, but you got to give it a week or two to kick in. And then your neurotransmitters and your hormones start to be affected by that light. Another thing that the morning light does, it skyrockets your dopamine. And it's weird. You'll find if you do sun gazing in the morning, you can't give two shits about your phone. The dopamine Mm-hmm. addiction of like phones yeah, and stuff yeah, like yeah. that. You just start forgetting about your phone. It's really weird. Oh my God, I would love that. Because you're <laughs> flooded with dopamine. That's what that light does. That's what red light does. So so those are like the natural hacks. So let me just summarize. So um, I'll add breath work, um, getting sun on your whole naked body, like midday sun, like find a place to get naked, get sun all over your body, uh, sun gazing at sunrise and sunset, and then cold and hot exposure to fortify your nervous system. So infrared saunas and ice baths or cryotherapy. And then um, eliminating blue light at night, which means white light, only having red and amber light. And you can do that by wearing eyewear that blocks all the blue light. Right. They used to be like fucking construction goggles on Amazon. Cute. Yeah, no, they have good... Tom Ford makes blue blocking glasses crazy. now. You know, it's like, dude, it's not that hard. Do you hard. remember? Because you're my, like around my age, the blue blocker <laughs> yeah, commercials yeah, totally. where they would stand there and they'd be like, oh, I've got dude, a blue blocker. Dude, th- there was a, the first guy I bought weed from in LA in 1988. Had blue blockers? No, his name was Geek. He was a rapper on Hollywood Boulevard and he was in the blue blocker ad. My name is Geek and these are my blue blockers. Oh my God, yeah, so, there was a rap so about it on the they commercial. They're looking at us like we're crazy because they're, they're nice and young. And I was like, I bought weed off that dude. But yeah. They were just like the really big with yeah. the orange. <laughs> well, that's that's how they were. But now, yeah. you know, obviously the market has demanded this and manufacturers are doing it. So, so those things, what those things do is they get you in alignment with the solar system, with the planet and also grounding, you yeah. know, having, um, you know, your bare feet on dirt, concrete, Touching a tree, These are touching all things a plant. people can do. Like you're not actually, you're not, I like that you're not saying you need to get this thing that I charge into. Well, it's not yeah. about money at all. Well, here, well, okay. That's so, and I know, you know, we're in the interest of time, we'll wrap it up, but <laughs> the, those are just the free things. And if you want to take it to the next level, 
you get a functional medicine doctor. I have a subscription with Parsley Health. I think that's the easiest way to go. Um, it's like the Uber of functional medicine. You get all your labs done. You really know what's going on. Then you supplement according to what you need or you, you have alterations to your diet or whatever the case may be. But everyone's going to waste a bunch of money on supplements you probably don't need. That you don't could, even know what you actually need. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, it's usually magnesium, vitamin D, um, your B vitamins. If like vegan people have some other challenges and things like that because there's things missing from that diet that you kind of have to supplement after some time. And so- you find out from functional medicine. Then there's the devices side. That would be this new thing. The biocharger is amazing. The amp <laughs> coil. It's another device I use almost every day. Um, red light therapy, yeah. vibration therapy. Um, there is molecular hydrogen, which you can take in these little tablets and also oh in an inhaler. Yeah. At my new house, one of the things that I really liked about it, it has a little back studio. And so I'm turning that into my biohacking lab. That's going to be amazing. Meditation room, man cave. And so, yeah, I'll be able to have people over, you know, more to experience some of that stuff and they won't have to be in my living room. So I'm, I'm looking forward to kind of, it's not like a business or something, but just be able to turn people on to some of that. So it's like you start with the nature stuff, then you do functional medicine, supplement as needed. And then you start breaking out the big guns if you want to get crazy <laughs> and looking into some of these technologies because they are really powerful. And all those technologies that are, you know, two to $15,000, these devices, they're really powerful healing devices. And why they are is because they all harness elements of nature, yeah. magnetism, light, electricity. Um, they're just taking things in nature and amplifying them because we're so disconnected that we need that extra boost. I love how you explain all of that, how we have just removed ourselves from our environment and that let's do your four yous before we run out of time. Sure. Wanna, so four quick takeaways for the audience. Well, let me get down to them. I love that. That means I didn't look at all. I, I just <laughs> scroll all the way down. Um, that is pretty good. <laughs> uh, what's a helpful tip for a valuable meditation? I really enjoy Vedic meditation. Um, for years, I did apps and visualizations and I would have to be listening to something. Otherwise, my mind would just fade away. I learned my meditation from a guy named Jeff Kober, actually lives right down the street and, and teaches nearby. But I, I mean, I've heard people talk about mindfulness meditation where you watch the breath and it sounds like the same kind it's of like thing. It's like an anchor. It's a different anchor. Yeah. It's, it's like... <sighs> It's like the mind is a really hyper dog and the mantra in Vedic meditation or TM, same kind of thing is like you throw something shiny over there and the dog kind of chases it. And that's the mantra and your mind starts kind of following that and it gives it something to do mm -hmm. in a very subtle way. And then you're able to just kind of drop in to that sense of awareness and consciousness without the mind driving you crazy. But if it does come back in, you don't criticize yourself and think, oh, I'm a shitty meditator. Now I'm thinking again. Trying to make yourself not think is like trying to make yourself not breathe. Right. It's going to torture you. You're going to drive yourself crazy if you think meditation is not thinking. Like you can't make the mind not think. I tell it to people all the time. I'm like, you think, period. Yeah. Like that's who you are. But in, in that tradition, what I, I really like is that there's like, you're supposed to lean up against something and be comfortable. Like I, I, I wouldn't do well, like trying to sit cross-legged. I, I made you sit like this for a while. Oh, no, no, it's fine. But I mean, like to meditate when I'm really uncomfortable, I can't drop in. And I see the value in the discipline of that. Because in Kundalini, you do shit for hours that's very uncomfortable. Oh. Yeah, and it's it's <laughs> great. But uh, I, I really like the mantra-based meditation. That's that's my my current favorite. And Kundalini is a lot of mantra too, so it makes sense. I yeah. get attracted to it. Yeah, totally. Um. Food, drink, or object you cannot live without? Coffee. Oh my God, a coffee with butter in it. You know, the Bulletproof mm -hmm. coffee recipe. Um, I use Bulletproof beans sometimes, but my friend Zen um, has a line called Zen Bunny. It's biodynamic coffee. <laughs> it's ridiculous. <laughs> it is ridiculously good. But yeah, I love me some, me some coffee with good fats. I think that's... That would be a tough one. Like when I went and did ceremony, uh, you know, you have to do the dieta before you go. And so for a couple of weeks before I didn't drink coffee. And you know, what's funny, actually, it was really easy to not drink coffee. And when I was there, I didn't drink coffee, even though they served it, which is weird. Um, but it kind of felt good that I could let it go, but I just don't want to because I love it. So it's your choice versus that control. It was weird because I've always thought I was addicted to it. 
And I was like, oh, this is going to be so hard. I'm not supposed to drink coffee. And then one day I was like, yeah, I'm not drinking coffee. I feel fine. Do you feel like you replaced, you know how some addicts replace their addiction with something else, even if it's something healthier? Do you feel like you replaced it or? Oh my God. Yeah. I replaced it with all kinds of things. Cigarettes. This was years ago. Cigarettes, porn, shopping, sugar, ice cream, pretty much anything that produces a big dopamine spike will keep an addict happy for a little while. But then again, the side effects of those behaviors start to kick in and eventually you got to quit all that shit. Favorite book? Hmm. God, I would have to say, I would have to say, Letting Go, The Pathway of Surrender by David Hawkins. I ordered it actually just recently. So good. And compared to all of his other books, it's so easy to read. He wrote it when he was close to death. And I I mean, I have to think he did it on purpose because he speaks so plainly and so simply in that book. And it's so applicable and digestible. His other books are super dense. I mean, you got to be really committed to read his (laughs) other books. They're they're gnarly. Uh, But that one, that one pretty much is the key to happiness. I mean, it really is because he explains the mechanism of surrendering to your thoughts, feelings, emotions, sensations in the moment by a means to overcome them. And it's extremely powerful, but it's so simple. It's it's like all my life I've been running from uncomfortable feelings. And destroying my life for many years, trying to stop those feelings when the answer to it was like, just feel the fucking feeling. Right. It's not that deep. So like <laughs> you have a wave of fear. Cool. Don't run. Don't pick up your phone. Don't like eat chocolate. Just sit there and be like, wow. Okay. Fear. Give me more. Give me more fear. Get a little anger. Cool. I'm not angry enough. Ah, you know, <laughs> fuck. I'm angry. And then you move past it. It's so incredible that you can actually just breathe through the things that we spend so much of our time and energy running from. I know. And, Isn't it amazing? Yeah. And he explains that. It's a simple that. change. Ah, it's a great, it's a great book. Yeah. What is, because we talked about self-care acts. So let me just say, what if you had one piece of life advice for people, what would it be? I would say, don't believe everything you think. It's a great one. The mind is fake news. Most shit that comes out of your fake mind. Fake news. <laughs> and most of the thing that comes out of your mind, my mind is like, it's just not true. It just makes up stories. You know, like say you text someone and they don't text you back. My mind will be like, oh, they hate me. Da, 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 da. It's probably because of that thing I said the other day, they took it the wrong way. And the mind will like spin out. And then later in the day, they're like, oh, hey, sorry, I was at a funeral. And you're like, God damn it, you stupid <laughs> fucking mind. You know, it's just like, you can't trust it. It is not a reliable source of information. It is not, which is yeah. kind of goes back to a lot of what we Yeah, now wisdom today. and intuition. And, you know, of course you can use the mind, you can use the brain to create anything. I mean, Einstein, great example of a good brain, a good mind, but um, he also had the spiritual awareness to know the difference, right? Between you know, inspiration and paranoia. Was. Yeah, crazy, Ahead right? Ahead of his time in so many ways. Yeah. Crazy. This has been amazing. Thank you. I would love Thank Next you. time we'll do this, and we'll take a walk outside while we do it. <laughs> right. So like really practice what you're saying. <laughs> well, in, I'm build, I built a studio or in the process of it in my new place, but I'm also going to build an outdoor one. Yeah, you for should. For when weather and leaf blowers permit. I'm going to record outside. <laughs> I'm going to be blowers. stoked. Yeah. This was awesome. I am so thankful you came in. Thank you so much. And you guys stay tuned because he's still going to do his personal practice, which is a Shakespeare quote. And if you haven't subscribed, please do. And please feel free to give us a review. It's very, very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. So fun. So fun. So now Luke is going to do his personal practice for us, which is a quote from Shakespeare. There is no such thing as good or bad only thinking makes it so. And that is a principle or statement that one could ponder your entire life or multiple lifetimes before you really unpack and digest the depth of that. It takes a high degree of humility and surrender to be able to step back and look at all of the perceived darkness and evil that exists in our world and not label it as bad. And also to have situations in which things are going your way and you're happy and you're getting everything you want. And you think, wow, this great event happened. This is good. And then later on, that turns out to be, uh, you know, a painful lesson. And you think, oh, I thought that was good, but now it's bad. Well, it's not good or bad. Everything is really neutral. And in a quantum physics meets spirituality sort of way, 
our reality can truly be created by our perception of it. And if one doesn't have the ability to change one's own perception, life becomes so painful that many of us reach outside of ourselves and find means by which to change our perception artificially without having built the muscle to do it ourselves. So I might walk out of here right now and get a parking ticket and think, oh, this sucks. This is bad immediately. What do you mean there's no such thing as good or bad? How could a parking ticket not be bad? Well, I have no idea uh, of the sequence of events that may have followed had I not taken the pause and, you know, taken that three seconds to pull that off my windshield. I might have been in an accident. I might have missed a chance meeting with a soulmate. You just don't know. There's so many things that are outside of our awareness and our control. And to relinquish all judgments and to have a truly open mind where positionalities are free to come and go at will is the key to happiness and freedom. <laughs>